The uh, next talk is going to be uh, entitled Common Pathology of the Temporal Bone. Um, and uh, we're going to step through some of the common things. We'll first talk about technique. So, uh, you know, I was always trained uh, by my old mentor, Tony Mancuso, is every time you give a talk, talk a little bit about the technique and just to indicate to the audience that the images that we're showing are not voodoo. Uh, anybody can uh, replicate these just by doing what we, uh, this, acquiring them the same way that we do. So for the temporal bone studies, you'll be able to replicate everything that we do if you follow these principles. And that is multi-detector imaging. Obviously, everyone's doing that. Um, again, 0.625, especially for the temporal bone, um, at least now, I think in 2006 is helpful. When a few years ago, we would say 1. Uh, you know, 1.5 or 1.25 was sufficient, but I think really now, in 2006, especially now that we've lowered our dose, uh, 0.625 I think is appropriate. Um, direct axial, and, and this is where it's a little bit different. I just want to take a show of hands for your temporal bone, for people doing temporal bone CTs, how many people are doing axials with coronal reformats? And then how many people are doing direct axials and direct coronals? Yeah, so I, I agree. I think right now we really have switched over to coronal reformats uh, in adults and children. And we always magnify um, each side to about a uh, nine centimeter field of view. So, you know, there's a, you know, one of my favorite sayings was Mark Twain, right? Good judgment comes from experience and experience comes from bad judgment. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, I have experience. Uh, so this is from my experience, if you will. So this was an older study. It was actually the first temporal bone study I, I ever read at University of North Carolina. So I had come, uh, just finished my fellowship at University of Florida. And uh, it's amazing, you know, the, um, I think I was the smartest I ever was when I was finishing my fellowship, because I knew all the answers, right? And I think it's been a steady downhill progression since then. So I was coming out of my fellowship. I knew everything, and uh, but I was new to the place, and I was always taught a very specific way to image the temporal bone. So I was recruited actually to UNC in part by the head neck surgeons there. So we went to a tumor board and they showed me this temporal bone and, and I said, you know, I don't, I'm the new person, I don't want to make too many changes and because I'm really smart, right, because I'm super smart. I don't need all that fancy stuff that I learned in my fellowship because that stuff was, you know, dumb people need that, I'm, I'm smart, right. So they showed me this, this case and um, you know, I said, well, there's a little bit of soft tissue thickening here in the tympanic membrane, excuse me, in the, um, in the um, middle ear cavity. Uh, uh, the ossicles there, they look fine to me, and um, I think it's a bunch of mucosal thickening. So this ENT surgeon, who was the head of ENT then and now, put his arm around me and said, well, there was a huge cholesteatoma. It eroded the tegmen tympani. The ossicles were eroded. And he said, well, Suresh, don't feel bad because you can't see ossicles on CT anyway. We know that. So I kind of got pissed off. Um, and then I went and changed all the temporal bone uh, CTs that we do. So uh, technique number one is that, and I get asked this a lot when I'm in the reading room, um, we'll do a head and neck study and they'll say, well, <clears throat> well, excuse me, we'll do a regular brain study. And they'll say, well, what do you think about that thing in the palate? Or what do you think about that thing in the ear? And I said, look, I've learned over time that if you really want to be um, accurate uh, and be right, uh, don't try to read detailed images uh, on the side or on the edge of a brain MR because you're going to be wrong more times than you're right. And I have to tell you, you know, in, in my role now as, a, as an administrator and as, as a chairperson where you have to become a little bit more facile about pre-authorizations and be wary about bringing patients back, um, I don't think we've been denied bringing a patient back that had a brain MR in order for a dedicated skull-based MR. So, we haven't run into that. Joe, have, I don't think we have patty problems, have you? Yeah. So at least, <laughs> I'm not a huge fan of the insurance companies, but um, by the same token, at, at times they, they, they do make the right decision. So when you do do these uh, 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 change of technique, this is what you should be seeing. So all of a sudden, once you see it, now you can see the apical and the middle turn of the, of the cochlea. You can see the modiolus, the base of the cochlear canal, the internal auditory canal, the vestibule, the anterior and posterior cruise of the stapes. This is the uh, maneuvering the malleus, excuse me, and the lenticular process of the incus. So this year we didn't, uh, oftentimes, I guess every other year, uh, I oftentimes just step through the normal anatomy of the temporal bone. We didn't do that this year, but next year if you come back, we can do that. So if, if you're not as familiar with this anatomy, you know, come back next year or something like that. <laughs> and I wanted to ask this question, because I, I see in the audience like a lot of familiar faces. How many of you are here for the first time? And how many are repeaters and have been here before? 
Wow, so it's about 50 years. Well, welcome back and thank you. I appreciate it. And how many of you are going to come back in the future? All right, that's great. All right. <laughs> Yeah, just as an FYI, I don't make a cent off of this. So, I mean, honestly, I, I do it just because I, I like to do it. So uh, there's nothing lining my pocket from you guys showing up. So, you know, it's, it's great to have you. Now, when I grew up in the, in the, uh, the last century, if you will, I, I did my residency at the, at the Brigham, and I went over to the Mass Eye and Ear. And the way that we interpreted the um, temporal bones at the time was doing something called conventional tomography. And, you know, radiologists, we don't get older, we get more experienced, right? So are there, are there any experienced radi audience, uh, radiologists in the audience, right, that, okay, that remember c conventional tomography, right? Remember those days? <laughs> Somebody just laughed, right? <laughs> it's like painful, right? You want to eliminate those days. But um, in the theme of what's old is what's new, what's new is what's old, um, these were the views that the Poshels and the Stenvers view were the views that we used to do on conventional tomography to end up looking at the middle ear cavity. And then I thought I was done with it. Then lo and behold, they returned. It's like, uh, everybody watches wa wa The Walking Dead? With the zombies that come alive, you step they're dead and they come back, right? It's just like the, the, it's like the Walking Dead for me. So the Poshel and the Stenvers views are back. So with the ability to perform multiplanar reconstructions, we now routinely perform these old Poshel and Stenvers view. The Poshel's view was taken in the plane parallel to the superior semicircular canal. And the Stenvers view is perpendicular to the superior semicircular canal. And we do this in particular to look for superior semicircular canal dehiscence. So it's a very topical issue. In fact, one of the most common reasons we do do temporal bone CTs at our shop is to look for superior semicircular canal dehiscence. So what about for MR? I think this is, everyone's doing this, you know, full course of the uh, cranial nerve 8. Slice thickness should not ex exceed 3 millimeters. And in our three Tesla, we're doing it 2 millimeters. Free contrast T1, uh, don't forget that, by the way, because there's certain pathologies that you can uh, miss if you don't do the pre contrast T1, especially trying to figure out fat in the petrous apex versus the cholesterol granuloma. Sometimes that can be a little tricky. Um, and remember, other things beside vestibular schwannoma can cause hearing loss. So we have to remember things like multiple sclerosis as well. Um, we're now doing routinely the high resolution, um, heavily. Uh, T2 weighted images, uh, you can call it drive, you can call it cis, you can call it fiesta, choose whatever you want to. But we're routinely getting this um, at our institution. And, and when you see this, you really do get some glorious detail by looking at the modiolus. You can see all four nerves of the inner ear. Oops, there you go. Uh, yeah. and, and you can see all four nerves within the inner ear, and I'll show this a little bit later. Also, you can do these very nice reconstructions where you can see the cristofalciformis here. You can see the cochlea the superior lateral semicircular canals, the vestibules, really very detailed imaging. So the anatomy. Now remember, in the inner ear, the, there are four nerves that run in the internal auditory canal. And so the top nerve here is the what? The seventh nerve. Um, and here is the seventh nerve right here. There's our seventh nerve here. And right posterior to the seventh nerve, this nerve right here is what? That's the superior vestibular nerve. So this is the whole concept of seven up. Remember the whole seven up thing with the seventh nerve up? And then below the seventh nerve is the cochlear nerve. So this is coke down. So remember the seven up coke down concept. So the seventh nerve is anterior and superior, and the cochlear nerve is um, anterior and, and inferior. And then posteriorly is the inferior vestibular nerve here. So when you look at this parasagittal view, and this really should be routine, just to orient ourselves, here's posterior and this is anterior. So here's our facial nerve, and here's our cochlear nerve, superior vestibular nerve, and the inferior vestibular nerve. So if you do the heavily weighted T2 weighted images, um, you should be seeing this. And this is routine on our IACs now. I remember when the cis imaging first came out, it would take us about, I think, six or seven minutes to do it. Uh, now with the advancements and MR, they take about two and a half minutes to do it. And, um, Certainly, I think it's, it's, it's very helpful. You can see all four nerves, but also you can see vestibular schwannomas without giving contrast. And again, back in the late 80s, uh, excuse me, the late 90s when this was first developed, um, some authors were saying we don't even need to give gadolinium for internal auditory canal MRs to look for vestibular schwannomas. And I think that's right. And in fact, we tried to do a discounted um, limited MR just to look for vestibular schwannomas, but it wasn't really fully accepted by our ENT surgeons because their view was, you know, if we're going to spend X amount of money to do it, you know, I want the full Monty. You know, I want to be able to see if there's any enhancement uh, 
um, dural enhancement, if I want to look for subtle areas of enhancement involving the facial nerve, I want to look for enhancement involving the cochlear, the vestibule, to look for labyrinthitis, which we'll talk about later. So it didn't really gain a lot of traction. But having said that, here's a typical appearance of a vestibular schwannoma. But, you know, I, you know, in certain days when you're really busy, it's potential you can miss this little enhancement right here involving the internal auditory canal. So if you do do the heavily T2-weighted images, just realize you can, I, sometimes I think the high-resolution imaging is actually more accurate than actually giving the contrast to look for vestibular schwannoma. So I really have found these beneficial. The other thing that... Um, that I've learned uh, in my residency, which uh, I was wrong, <laughs> was that back when I grew up again, they say that vestibular schwannomas used to arise right here at the porous acousticus. And there was something called, I think it was the Obermeyer-Steiner line or something like that. Is it? Obersteiner-Redlich line, yeah, thanks. Obersteiner-Redlich line. And it felt that this was a transition between um, myelinated and unmyelinated nerve, right, Doug? Is that right? And it was felt to be unstable, if you will. And that's where vestibular schwannomas arose from. And again, I think it was back from the days of conventional tomography when the only t way we could make this diagnosis was to look for expansion of the porous acoust acousticus, right? Well, in actuality, uh, we see now that the vestibular schwannomas, at least that I see in the early stage, arise in the internal auditory canal. And the spread pattern, at least the way I've interpreted it, is they tend to get larger and larger and they grow more towards the brainstem. And then once they get out of the porous acousticus, they do kind of explode like, like an ice cream cone, if you will. So um, just realize when you are looking for vestibular schwannomas, make sure to pay particular attention in the fundus of the internal auditory canal. Well, this was the way that we learned anatomy. Uh, the cochlea back in, in medical school, we had an apical, middle, and, and basal turn. In the textbooks, we learned about the interscalar septum, which was the bone that looked like this. We also learned about the basilar membrane, and we also learned about the organ of Corti. Um, and, you know, lo and behold, I never would have imagined, this is Shutnuk's anatomy uh, on the right. Shutnuk did the, the famous anatomic, uh, 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 famous uh, pathologic sections through the inner ear. And this is what we can see clinically now. So when you look at this, you can see the apical, and the, uh, this is actually the, the middle and the apical turn of the cochlea. But you can see the inner scalar septum, which is a black here. This correlates very nicely to the anatomy. And you can see this line right here, that's actually the basilar membrane. So now even the internal structures of the cochlea can be seen uh, very elegantly. We haven't gotten down to the organ of Corti yet, but occasionally I have been to talks where uh, you may be able to see the, um, scalar, the scalar, medially, uh, scalar media as well. Well, when we look in the inner ear as well, this is how we learned about things in medical school. There was actually a macula of the utricle, and now when we do our MR, we can now see, if you look very closely, if you look in the vestibule, you'll see this little smudgy area here. Now, when I first saw that, this was shown to me by Jan Kasselman about 10 years ago. I thought it was artifact. But, you know, over time, what I've done, I came back and looked at what we did, and it turns out, yes, this is actually the macula of the utricle. So we can actually look inside not only the vestibule, but if you go back to here, the, vest the vestibule is actually formed by the, the saccule and the utricle. So now we can actually look inside the utricle and see the macula, that sensory epithelium that allows us to have balance. So for me, it's really uh, amazing um, where we've come over the last few years. And I see, see if this is going to work for me or not. Uh, no, it's not working, but uh, that's okay. Um, one other thing to look for when we're looking at the, the middle ear is that any time that you have a patient that with unilateral serous otitis media, and again, remember, uh, you know, from my standpoint, the brain is an accessory organ of the neck, you know, as is the chest, the abdomen, and, and the arms, essentially, right? But some people feel that the neck is not as important as other structures uh, a little bit further north. So when you are looking at the brain, remember to look at the skull base. And if you see in the skull base, if you do see this unilateral mucosal thickening involved in the mastoid air cells, make sure that you start looking in the nasal pharynx. Because if you look in the nasal pharynx, occasionally you will pick up these patients that have nasopharyngeal carcinomas, because the nasopharyngeal carcinomas will obstruct the eustachian tube, and when they obstruct the eustachian tube, then you'll end up having this mucosal thickening. And from a medical legal standpoint, I can tell you I have seen a few cases where um, this has potentially uh, turned into an issue. So um, one of the things I always recommend when you're looking at the brain, I always look at the top and the bottom. Look at the very top, but also look at the very bottom. Make sure you look below the skull base. All right, let's talk a little bit about 
some of the pathology. So the first thing that we'll talk about is disease that's called otosclerosis. Now, how many of you have heard of otosclerosis? Most. All right, so otosclerosis is really, it's, it's, I would characterize it as, as a unique disease of the otic capsule. No, no one really knows what the etiology is. Um, it is primarily an autosomal dominant with incomplete penetrance. It's a little bit more common in females than in males. And um, it's due to abnormal resorption and deposition of bone in the middle ear. It's, it still is a clinical diagnosis, but, but I say that with a little bit of trepidation because I'm going to show you the characteristic findings of otosclerosis. And clinically, our ENT colleagues, our otologists, will, will say, well, you know, that's not really otosclerosis what you're seeing because we make the diagnosis based on audiology. Well, I'm not 100% sure on this because our imaging has got so good that we're starting to look at early depositions as you'll see a resorption of the bone. So I actually think sort of similar to the cranial nerve and the perineural involvement. Years ago when we would say this, we would get poo-pooed and say, yeah, you really can't see cranial nerve involvement. Just like that, my old uh, colleague at UNC said, we can't see ossicles on CT. I'm really coming to the conclusion that we can see otosclerosis before the findings are present audiologically um, with the classic findings. So when we look at otosclerosis, again, anatomy is so important right here. So I'll take a little bit of time to go over the anatomy. So here's the internal auditory canal. Here is the middle turn of the cochlea. Here's our vestibule right here. And this is the ice cream cone, right? Here's the head of the malleus and the short process of the incus. And this back here is the sinus tympani. The key thing to look for otosclerosis is that if you look at the oval window. So here's the oval window. And the most anterior aspect of the oval window has a specific name to it. Anybody, anybody remember the name? What was it? Yeah, it's called the fistula anafinestrum. This is the fistula anafinestrum. And in this area here, you can see some rarefaction of bone. So if you are looking for otosclerosis, the first thing that you have to look for is look right here at the fistula anafinestrum because that's the earliest sign. So histologically, this is what Schuttnick identified. So here is our oval window. And right here at this bone right here, this is the fistula anafinestrum. And this is what this looks like histologically. And this is what we see on CT scan. Now, because this is occurring at the oval window, if I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, but none of you are Latin scholars anyway, for Pete's sake. But uh, remember, I think window in Latin is fenestrum. And so this is why this is called fenestral otosclerosis. Now, if you have otosclerosis and you have it behind the window, this is what's referred to as retrofenestral otosclerosis. So in this particular case, we can see all of this rarefaction of bone surrounding the dense bone surrounding the cochlea. So this is behind the oval window, and this is why this is called retrofenestral otosclerosis. Occasionally, you can see uh, cochlear enhancement. And for, again, for those of you that have read about otosclerosis, there was something called a Schwartz sign where the, uh, the, the, the surgeons, could, otologists could look in and see this blue haziness involving the cochlea. I'm not sure how accurate that is. If, can you guys see that? There's a surgeon in the back. Have you ever seen a Schwartz sign before? No? Now, even when I talk to the uh, otologists, uh, 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 the attendings, I haven't seen that before. But anyway, the reason why you used to get, or it was the Schwartz sign was described, is that you would get a little bit of hyperemia involving this bone along the cochlear promontory. But this is the radiological correlate. Everybody see this little rarefaction of bone surrounding the cochlea. So that's what we mean by pericochlear lucencies. And if you do your MR just right, this is kind of, um, um, I very rarely see this. This is pre-contrast and post-contrast. This is diffuse enhancement involving the cochlea. So one thing that I always have to caution myself is that as I'm looking through the films, I look at internal auditory canal MRIs. You know, I'm looking for vestibular schwannomas, right? That's number one. I'm looking for dural enhancement. That's number two. But I always have to pay attention to the cochlea because remember, patients that have hearing loss often have dizziness, often have vertigo, and one of the causes can be otosclerosis. And if you're doing an MR for patients with vertigo and dizziness, remember, they still could have otosclerosis, and you have to look for that enhancement involving the inner ear. Now, this is one thing that has come up a little bit uh, more uh, uh, recently, <clears throat> and that's the whole concept of the third window. So we'll look at a CT scan, and we'll see the middle turn and the apical turn, and we'll look for the typical findings of otosclerosis, and we may not see it here, 
involved in the fistula. But if you look at the interim auditory canal, sometimes you'll see the smudginess of the bone, or sometimes you'll just see frank cavitation that looks like this. And this was always a head scratcher, because I looked at this and I wasn't quite sure, but it turns out that this was described by Schutnik back in the 1950s. And this is actually the third window. This is also otosclerosis. So not only can you get otosclerosis involved in the oval window, the fenestral or the retrofenestral, but you can also get it adjacent to the interim laudatory canal. So this is the whole concept of the third window. Any questions so far? You with me? All right. Okay. What I'm now going to talk about are the inner ear malformations. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you the classical approach. Now, I'm well aware now that we have more information about specific genetic mutations and there are newer classifications that have come out, IP1, IP2, IP3. Um, I think in itself, those are somewhat controversial. I'm not a completely accepted these. But what, what I'm going to do is, is tell you about the classic inner ear malformations. Because like, like I mentioned before, it's, I don't know, for those of you that took the boards, I was a little panicked when I took my boards, right? And so I said to one of my attendings, I said, you know, what if, they, what if they show me a weird inner ear? He said, if they show you a weird inner ear, just say Mundini and go to the next case, right? right? Just, just get rid of it, right? Well, not everything is a Mundini malformation. So what I want to do is, is show you what, an approach, and it's really based on the embryology. Because, you know, head neck, head neck radiology for me is fast. Obviously, I love what I do, right? I think it's the greatest thing in the world. But you also have to realize that you have to know a little bit of spectroscopy and molecular imaging in these days. You have to know anatomy. Um, but you also have to remember a little bit of embryology. And if you understand the embryology of how the inner ear develops, then you'll be able to understand the inner ear malformations. So the way the inner ear develops is that there is the creation of this structure here, which is the otic vesicle. And, and over time, the otic vesicle starts to differentiate. So you have this area, eventually this area becomes a cochlea, this area becomes a vestibule, and the, uh, excuse me, well, the utricle and the saccule, and these areas differentiate into a semicircular canal. So <clears throat> the type of inner ear malformation that you're going to see is going to depend on where the arrest occurs in embryogenesis. So the first thing is that if you have no formation of an otic vesicle, and this is rare, you're going to have what's referred to as a Michelle's anomaly. And these are very rare. In fact, the first case I ever showed, Doug gave it to me about 20 years ago. I don't know if you remember, he gave me a case of Michelle's. And I used it up until the point I got this case. So this was a nice example. But a Michelle's anomaly is essentially there's the otic vesicle is not formed, and all you have is formation of the ossicles. And like sort of Doug said, you've seen one, you may never see another one, but this is a Michelle's anomaly. And this is what it normally looks like. So this is the, the cochlea, this is the vestibule, this is what you should normally see, and here's the inner ear structures. But in this case, we can just see the ossicles without any inner ear. So that's a, that's a Michelle's. Now, if you have formation of the otic vesicle and then you have an arrest, you can see this looks like a blob, right? It kind of looks like a blob. Well, this is what I refer to as a common cavity malformation. Because the common cavity is the otic vesicle is formed and then you have your arrest. So this is what it looks like in the inner ear. Literally, it just looks like a water balloon. So you have a water balloon in the inner ear. There's no cochlea, there's no vestibule, there's no nothing. And this is what's referred to as a common cavity. Now, if you have continued development and then you have an arrest, now you have a little bit of formation of the cochlea and you have some formation of the vestibule and some formation of the semicircular canals. Because the cochlea is not completely formed, this is what we refer to as cochlear hypoplasia. So as I showed you before, you know, this looked like a blob. So what do you think this is going to look like? This is not going to look as blob-ish. It's probably going to have a little bit more separation into vestigial uh, uh, vestibule and cochlea. But clearly, it's not going to be as clearly formed as, as the, the normal ear. So this is a little bit um, very early, and if there's a little bit more differentiation, this is still a deformed cochlea. So this is what we would expect to see, and this is what we see radiologically. So what we see here is the middle ear cavity. There's our ice cream cone. Anteriorly is the cochlea, and posteriorly is the vestibule. So with a leap of faith, you can kind of see how this is the vestibule and this is the cochlea. Similarly, a little bit more advanced, here's a little bit of the cochlea, and here's a little bit of the vestibule. So it clearly doesn't look as um, 
too created or as detailed as what we will see, but, but clearly there's more separation here than we saw when we just had the odic vesicle. Now, what if we have a little bit more formation and then we have an arrest? And this is when we get into the Mundini malformation. Now, one of the reasons we don't see cochlear hypoplasia very much, or the Michelle's very much, is that these are early development in the fetus. And sometimes the fetus uh, is a, it doesn't make it. Unfortunately, it, it's aborted and it turns into a miscarriage. The thing is, the Mundini malformation really is the latest development um, just before the, the fetus becomes viable. So that's why we tend to see more Mundini malformations than anything else. So what a Mundini malformation is fusion of the apical and the middle turns with a normally formed basilar turn. Now, everyone's heard of Mundini, right? So, you know, do you know how, um, who Mundini was or, or how we described this? I, I find this fascinating. So, Mundini was, you know, described this before the days of CT and MR, obviously. And he described it in a two-year-old that was run over by a wagon back in the late 1880s. So, the child was run over by a wagon, developed this bad sepsis, and then died. Now, Mundini knew this kid. And this kid was congenitally deaf his whole life. In fact, it was bilateral. So essentially, because he knew the family, um, he ended up doing a necropsy on the child after he died. So that's how Mundini first, uh, that's why it's called a Mundini malformation. And so what he actually described was a fusion of the apical and middle turns with the normally formed basal turn. That is the definition of a true Mundini malformation. So this is the histologic section. There is the basilar turn with fusion of the apical and the middle turns. And then what we see here is there's our fusion of the apical and the middle turns with a normally formed basilar turn. Now, what Mundini described was what was something else. Do you know what we're looking, anybody want to guess what we're looking at right here? Let me go one more, yeah. Any idea what that is? Yeah, that's the vestibular aqueduct, and we'll talk about the vestibular aqueduct because what Mundini actually described was this disease entity. So the vestibular aqueduct is located along the posterior margin of the temporal bone. And this is the endolymphatic sac that runs in the vestibular aqueduct. And you can have this disease entity, which is enlarged vestibular aqueduct. And if you see a kid with an enlarged vestibular aqueduct, pay close attention to the cochlea. Because nine times out of 10, you're going to have an abnormality involving the cochlea as well. And that's actually what Mundini described. Mundini described fusion of the apical and the middle turns and he also described an enlarged vestibular aqueduct. So those of you that are head and neck people out there, there is this entity of enlarged vestibular aqueduct. This is actually what Mundini described. So when we talk about, about a Mundini malformation, we kind of focus on the cochlea, but in actuality, he described this entity where the cochlea is malformed, but also the vestibular aqueduct is malformed. So the point is, if you see something that looks like the cochlea is abnormal, Take a look at the posterior aspect of the Peters bone. Similarly, if you see an abnormality involving the vestibular aqueduct, take a close look at the cochlea as well, too. So this is the enlarged vestibular aqueduct. There is a fusion of the apical and the middle turns, and you can also make the diagnosis on MR. So here's our cochlea, and here's the enlarged vestibular aqueduct seen on MR. And again, when we're ramming through our IAC MR studies, again, we're looking for vestibular schwannomas, but remember, look for that cochlear enhancement, and then also look on the T2-weighted images, look for enlargement of the vestibular aqueduct as well. All right, the next thing that we'll talk about is labyrinthitis. So what's, what exactly is labyrinthitis? Labyrinthitis, it's pure and simply, it's just an infection of the inner ear, right? And it can be caused by either the type of germ that causes it, so it can be bacterial, viral, syphilitic, fungal, toxic, or autoimmune, or it can be caused by the route of spread. So it can be due to a middle ear infection, meningi uh, 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 meningitis, bloodborne, or post-traumatic. So what exactly is labyrinthitis? What it is is that it, acute labyrinthitis is essentially when you have pus in the cochlea. So um, <clears throat> what happens in acute labyrinthitis? It's just like any place else in the body. Anytime that you have pus, you're going to ha elicit some type of inflammatory response. So an acute labyrinthitis involving the inner ear is when you have pus involved in your inner ear, and then when you give contrast, you can see this enhancement of the cochlea compared to the opposite side. 
And in this case, we can actually identify the cause of the labyrinthitis, and this is due to an infection involving the middle ear. So this is what we would refer to as tympanogenic cause of labyrinthitis because of this direct effect. But on the other hand, if we have a labyrinthitis that's chronic, that's been there for a while, the way the body responds to this acute infection that's not treated is it lays down its version of a scar. So for instance, if you have a cut and you keep cutting yourself, eventually it's not going to heal itself. You're going to develop a scar. And that's the way to think of this disease entity, which is obliterative labyrinthitis or labyrinthitis occipitans. Essentially, it's an infection involving the inner ear that was never treated. And eventually what happens, <clears throat> you develop this deposition of this fibrosseous material into the channels of the cochlea. So in this particular case, we can see the inner ear, excuse me, the internal auditory canal. Here's our petrous bone. And this, we can see the ghost, if you will, of the cochlea. And with a leap of faith, you can see a little bone right here that's been deposited in the cochlea, corresponding what we would expect to see on the pathologic sections that shouldn't have described many years ago. So that, if you will, is the chronic labyrinthitis. We can diagnose this with CT or we can diagnose this with MR. So again, the other thing to look for when you're looking at your MRs in patients with hearing loss is make sure you look at the fluid within the inner ear because that fluid should be nice and bright. If you don't see the bright fluid, that tells you you have something replacing the cochlea as well too. So that's labyrinthitis ossificans. And next, we're going to finish up with cholesteatoma. Now, cholesteatoma is probably the most common reason you're performing a temporal bone CT, right? You probably see it every single day. So what I want to do is go over the pathogenesis of cholesteatoma. These other things, like the inner ear malformations and otosclerosis and the labyrinthitis, you may occasionally see it in a general practice. But cholesteatoma is something that you will definitely see. So, um, you know, this was the definition of cholesteatoma. Uh, it's keratinizing debris that arises from the desquamation of the squamous epithelial lining. I have no idea what that means. I have no clue. I really don't. But it kind of Doug said this before. The way I think of cholesteatoma is skin growing in the wrong place. So what I want to do is talk a little bit about where these cholesteatomas are. So cholesteatomas occur in two flavors. There's a, an acquired cholesteatoma and there's a congenital cholesteatoma. And this is the pearly white mass that's been described. So in a, in a child or an adult that's never had um, significant ear disease, the surgeons can look in, the otologists can look in the external auditory canal, and they can see the pearly white mass. And if they're really lucky, sometimes they can see these bubbles that, that actually arise from the tympanic membrane. Now, I don't know, do you guys have the surgeons, have you ever seen the bubbles in cholesteatoma? The tympanic memory, is that yes or no? 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 OK, yeah. I don't know, but some people tell me they can see the little bubbling of the tympanic membrane. But the pearly white mass is, is the classic finding. So how do we make the diagnosis of a congenital cholesteatoma? Well, first of all, there has to be no history of a prior ear infection. That is really, really important. There, has, there can be no history of prior ear infection. And then when we look in the middle ear, we can see this focal soft tissue mass that tends to be close, but really separate from the cochlear promontory. Because if you did see a mass right here on the cochlear promontory that was red, then what diagnosis would you think about? Yeah, glomus tympanicum tumor, right. But in, if you see a pearly white mass in this location, then you're thinking about congenital clustertoma. But notice the mastoid air cells. See how they're well aerated? They look pristine. So the surgeons look in, they see a pearly white mass in a kid. The mastoid air cells look well aerated. This is the diagnosis of congenital cholesteatoma. Now, this is a very large congenital cholesteatoma. Sometimes it can be called an epidermoid. Some people have advocated diff doing diffusion imaging just to confirm the diagnosis. I, I assume it can be helpful when it's this big. But in general, I think you can make this diagnosis from across the room. But acquired cholesteatoma is something completely different. So an acquired cholesteatoma is due to chronic ear disease. And the chronic ear disease is felt to re result in obstruction of the eustachian tube. 
So, you know, you've probably had this before. When you fly and you land, what happens to your ears? They get what? They're blocked up. And so what do you end up doing in order to open your ears? Uh, do, do like this, right? So what you're doing is actually you're trying to open that eustachian tube, and you're trying to open that channel between the back of your throat and the middle ear cavity. So normally what happens is that you have a uh, junk and basically, it's all of the uh, squamous epithelial cells that normally exit your ear. They usually go that way, right? And the reason they go that way is that the opening between the back of your throat and the middle ear is patent. And essentially, all the vectors are pushing all this junk out of your ear. But if you have eustachian tube dysfunction, what ends up happening? you have a reversal and all of the stuff, all of the, the pressure is now heading this way. So as a result, this causes retraction of the tympanic membrane. Now there are two parts of the tympanic membrane. There's the pars tensa, which is the tense part. And anybody remember the second part? Pars flaccida, exactly right. And the pars flaccida tends to be along the superior portion of the tympanic membrane. So if you now have the vectors going this way, what part of the tympanic membrane is going to retract? It's going to be the pars what? Flaccida, which is up here, because the rest of it is pretty tense. So what ends up happening is that as, as you have this, um, this uh, change of the vectors, all of the stuff that normally flows out of the ear is now going to get sucked back in. And because the pars flaccida retracts, this is where this junk is going to end up. Now, once it gets bigger and bigger, you can't end up with a cholesteatoma. But what do you end up calling this space, which is just lateral to the ossicles and just medial to this wall right here? What space is that? Prusak space. And that's why cholesteatomas arise in Prusak space. Because the vectors reverse, the flaccid part of the tympanic membrane is superiorly, and eventually, the pars flaccida gets sucked in. So that's why this occurs in Prusak space. And this is the whole concept of the invagination theory of cholesteatoma. So this actually was a pathologically proven retraction pocket. The surgeons went in, they took it out, and this was a small retraction pocket located right here in Prusak space, and there is the sputum. Now, oftentimes, I'll get asked, isn't the sputum the first bone that's eroded? I mean, don't you need sputal erosion to make the diagnosis? And the answer is no. And I think how this came into the literature was, again, a result of conventional tomography. Because when you did conventional tomography, we just don't have the anatomic detail that we do now. So the most reliable bone to become blunted that we could see on conventional tomography was the sputum. So therefore, we'd say, yeah, the sputum's blunted or eroded. Therefore, that's cholesteatoma. But in actuality, at least in my experience, and you know, I can ask Doug too, the sputum tends to be the last bone eroded. I don't know if you, that's pretty, not, not, not as common. And usually for me, the, the bone that's most commonly eroded when I see it is actually the incus. It's a long process of the incus. So how do we make the diagnosis of cholesteatoma? First of all, you need to see a focal soft tissue mass, and there has to be either erosion or displacement of the ossicles. So in this particular case, we can see the maneuver of the malleus, we can see the anterior and posterior cruise of the stapes, and we see the soft tissue mass. On the right side, we can see the head of the malleus, and we can see absence of the short process of the incus. So soft tissue mass plus ossicular erosion or displacement equals cholesteatoma. And if the patient has had a history of chronic ear infection, that's how we make the diagnosis of an acquired cholesteatoma. Another example here, on the left-hand side, we see a normal appearance of the middle ear cavity. Anybody know the name of the septum right here? It starts with a K. Kerner septum, exactly right. And then on the right-hand side, we can see the soft tissue mass, and notice how Kerner septum is gone, and we see absence of the normal labyrinthine bone in the mastoid air cells. So this is the indication here that we're dealing with cholesteatoma again. We can do MR to look for cholesteatoma. In general, we tend not to. If you do do it, cholesteatomas tend not to enhance with contrast. However, diffusion imaging can be helpful. So this is an example of a patient underwent multiple ear surgery, three or four. The patient still had drainage coming from the surgical site. We did a diffusion-weighted imaging, and this is the B1000, and we can see high signal here involving the cholesteatoma. So this is very bright. So, we do use cholesteatomas at our place, and we are using echoplanar cholesteatoma. 
The best diffusion to use really is line scan, but not all the vendors offer it. But if we do have you know, a, a pretty decent sized mass and we're still not sure whether or not it's cholesteatoma, we will recommend an MR and specifically to look for diffusion because in cases such as this where you have these indeterminate lesions here, you're not sure what that is. If you do do the diffusion imaging, there it is bright and here is the ADC value, see how it's dark. So in selected cases, Diffusion imaging can be helpful to distinguish mucosal thickening from residual or recurrent cholesteatoma. So in selected cases, we do find it helpful. So in summary, what we tried to do over the last 40 minutes or so is talk about technique, a little bit about anatomy. We talked about otosclerosis, the inner ear malformations, labyrinthitis, and we ended up really with the most common disease entity that you'll be performing temporal bone CTs, and that's cholesteatoma. So thank you very much for your attention.